Okay, uh, let's start to have a class. Uh, we will try to finish the, the staining technology today, but we'll have a lots of information. And it's also corresponding to our lab. The lab will do gram stain today and the endospore staining on Thursday. Okay, so staining technology we already mentioned. Let's just go over. We have the um, smear preparation, air dry heat fixing, add a dye, and then we rinse and then use a microscope to do the observation. That's what we already practiced using the simple stain. And then this is talk about the simple stain and the negative stain. We will mention about the negative stain later on. And when we when we using the stain, uh, because the basic dyes are positively charged, and the acid dyes are negatively charged, so instead of the staining the specimen, they're staining the background. And when we see a specimen showing up, we can see the size, the shape, the morphology, and also the arrangement of the bacteria. So you see the crystal violet staining of the E. coli there, and the methylene blue staining the corner bacteria. We will mention corner bacteria diphtheria in our exam too. Now, by the way, the methylene blue is a dye we did not use in the lab because this dye does not have a very good positive charge. So if you do not have a very good trained staining technology at the learner, we usually don't use uh, methylene blue. Instead, we just use crystal violet. This is a negative stain. We'll go back to talk about that. Okay. Today, we will finish most introduction of those staining technology, but more important is the gram stain. So what we're going to talk about today, staining technology, we will pay much attention to talk about the gram stain. And then we will talk about endospore stain. Uh, acid fast staining uh, capsule stain uh, capsule stain let me think about uh, S -U -L -E. capsule stain um, collagen stain And we also will talk about the introduction of electron microscope. So this is what we have. Okay, let's talk about the gram stain. The main procedure is there, but we want to go much more detail than this. Okay, gram stain. Lab 1, 930 already did the gram stain. So gram stain is created by a Danish scientist, Chris Graham, in 1886. I believe it's in Berlin, in Germany. This is a very magic and a smart tool. And it is a differentiated stain. And this staining technology could differentiate, basically is for bacteria, into two different categories, which is, we already know, gram-positive and the gram negative. Gram positive will stay, will stay in, we say it's blue or we say purple. And the gram negative staining is looks like pink or red. So, so we say pink or red. And this is for bacteria and for fungi. Dennis Graham also mentioned about this in his report. For fungi, we all say gram stain 
blue. Okay? So this is the basic one. Now, what is the major steps of the gram stem? That major steps is encoding four. Number one is we going to using crystal violet. So crystal violet, if you see in the lab, it is a very violet color um, dye. And it's staining very strong, very strong positive charge. So the function, this is a basic dye. Then followed by the second step, which is we will be adding gram iodine. And we all know the iodine. Okay? It's a chemicals could be testing starch. We'll talk about it in the starch lab later on. And the gram iodine will let crystal violet staining <coughs> strong. So we call it is a modern staining strong. Okay, then the third step is we will be using 95% alcohol. And this is called decoloration. So basically, you know, although we have those dye, but when we use alcohol, 95% alcohol, we added, basically we wash them off, so we call it a decoloration process. And finally, we will add is a saffroning. And this is what we call a counter stain. So, basically, we, what you could see, gram-positive bacteria, they staining purple, or we say blue, it is crystal violet color. And the gram-negative bacteria is staining pink and red, it is saffroning, counter-stain color. So these are the basic things we want to mention. Now, we, we've got to move on to a big question. Is why gram-positive bacteria, it is purple, or we say blue, and the gram-negative bacteria, it is pink, or we say red. Now, this is uh, regarding to a two different theory. So the first theory is cell wall theory. So related to the cell wall theory, we need to know the basic structure of a gram-positive and a gram-negative bacteria. And the more detail we're going to talk about on Thursday, but we could draw a brief picture. Okay, I had a gram-positive bacteria. And we have a gram-negative bacteria right here. So when we draw this, first of all, is a layer everybody should know. What are the layer? The phospholipids. We have the phospholipids, which is inserted with a different protein, and in a moving, balance the status. This is called the fluid mosaic model. And we also should know this guy has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic <coughs> tail, which means like water and dislike water. Okay, the same thing for gram-negative bacteria. Exactly the same thing. And it's a protein there. It could be attached. It could be in intercourse, this whole membrane system. And it also could be doing the 
major for the transport of the nutrition and the waste outside the inside of the um, of the cell membrane system. So this is the same thing. Now then we move on to the next one. For gram positive bacteria, there is a very thick structure right here. And this is called peptidoglycan. And the peptidoglycan is basically a polysaccharide. And this is composed by modified sugar, cross-link with amino acids. Okay, we'll talk later on Thursday. Granitic bacteria also has a peptide of glycan, but it is very thin. So this is also peptide of glycan. Okay, above the gram positive bacteria, what are we gonna have? We'll have something like that. Something like this. That's called tachoic gases. Oh, this is called a lipotechoic acid. Uh, the function is unknown. We don't know about that. Now, for gram-negative bacteria, there is a double layer right here. Okay, so we draw it briefly. Of course, there is a space there, okay? It basically has some space there. So if we draw one more thing, there is a double layer. So another layer of the fluid mosaic model. But more important to what they have, you have this guy comes out, LPS. Lipopolysaccharides. And the LPS will generate a toxin, which is we call it an endotoxin. This is the reason why E. coli, salmonella, all those gram-negative bacteria will cause a problem because the LPS, lipopolysaccharides. So when you see this structure, remains the two theory. Number one is cell wall theory. What is that? Gram-positive bacteria has a thick peptidoglycan. And the gram-negative bacteria has a very thin peptidoglycan. So what happens is, when you add a basic dye, a crystal violet, it's staining there. When you have a gramidine, make the dye staining more stronger, and then you do a 95% alcohol decoration. For gram-positive bacteria, we have a thick peptidoglycan, they can hold on, crystal violet, during decoloration process. Instead of, we had a granitic bacteria because they only have a very thin peptide of glycan. So, certainly this does not going to work. So when you add a 95% of alcohol, it's gone. And then, after you add 95% of alcohol, what will happen? It's empty, it's blank, and we have to add something there. So we add a saffronin. And the saffronin is pink or red color. That's why gram-negative bacteria is pink and red. So this is does not work. So instead, saffronin color show. Okay, that is a cell wall theory. I believe this is the one you already know and you already learned in your biology 101 or different classes. But there is a second theory, which is called a lipid theory. So what is a lipid theory talk about? 
We have a gram-positive bacteria and a gram-negative bacteria. The lipids amount is different. Gram-positive bacteria, the lipids, is about 5%. And the gram-negative bacteria, the lipids, is 10 to 15%. Why? Because of the lipopolysaccharides. The lipopolysaccharides, we have a lipids A. And this is their core major components. Because of that, it's not only provide the toxin, but also give bacteria a higher, I would say a higher, relatively higher amount of the lipids. So what happens for lipid? Lipid is not dissolved in the water. You know that. That's why the oil is floated on the water solution when you make a soup. But it's dissolved in the alcohol. It's well dissolved in the alcohol. So for gram-negative bacteria, you still increase the violet. You add iodine. Looks like it's very good. But when you add 95% alcohol together with the lipids, those dye will all dissolve. That's why it's colorless and it's black. However, for gram-negative bacteria, or for gram-positive bacteria, because it only has 5% of the lipids, so it's not enough. When you do the decoloration, the crystal violet color is still there. OK? So if we want to complete the sentence, gram-negative bacteria have 10 to 5% of lipids. So together with crystal violet, It's dissolved, well dissolved in alcohol, in 95% alcohol. So that's why by that stage it is colorless, and you can't understand what's happening to show that. So uh, based on this theory and the cell wall structure, uh, we need to know something is grandstand need to use young culture. We say young, fresh culture. What this means, usually the bacteria have to grow 35 degrees Celsius around the 24 hour, a fresh one. You cannot use the older one. If the culture is more than 72 hour, what will happen? The peptidoglycan is starting to cracking down. It's not going to hold on crystal violet during decoloration process. So no matter what you do, it's all going to stay in gram negative, which means the color is pink or red. So if you use the old culture, it all will stay in like Grand negative, pink color. So we say grand variable state, staining. Another tricky thing is that this 95% alcohol decoloration process has to be stick to 10 seconds. If it's too long, it also will be washed off. Okay? Now, what the results of the gram stain we should be recording? This is what we're going to talk about in the lab. But I want to mention here is that you always going to record in the three items is gram reaction, gram positive or negative. The second one is cell morphology. It's a cock cell laws of vibro. And last one is a cell arrangement, which means it could be a single cell, it could be a, a different cock cell, like Streptococcus ammonian, it could be a chain, like a Streptococcus, or it could be a grape shake, like Staphylococcus. So that's something about the gram stain. And it is very important. So I'll just draw the picture right here. And this is the one. A very good picture which is tells you 
the procedure how we do the gram-stain. And uh, regarding the gram-staining, the story behind that, we already introduced to cell wall theory and the lipid theory, and detailed the cell wall structure we're going to talk about uh, uh, on Thursday. Okay, so that's a gram-staining. This is a very important slide, so please remember that. The second one, what we want to talk about is acid fast stain. Uh, acid fast stain is for a very special bacteria, Micrococcus tuberculosis, or mycobacteria. So the second one we want to talk about is acid stain. Uh, we will not do this in the lab. Instead, we do the endospore stem for the procedure is relatively similar. So this is a one for mycobacteria. Mycobacteria, there is basically two major stuff, <coughs> species. Mycobacteria tuberculosis will cause tuberculosis, which is TB. We already mentioned in the lecture one when we introduced Bob Cook. Another one is Mycobacteria leporium. This is could cause hunchback, which means the deboing. Okay, cannot accumulate enough calcium. So it causes bone deboing. That's some symptoms. Now, what is make it very special? Mycobacteria. Their cell wall structure is a little bit different compared to E. coli and Salmonella or those things. It has a very waxy cell wall. The reason is they have a major component is mycolic acids. And the mycolic acids is a long chain unsaturated fatty acids. So because of the mycolic acid, it makes it a very waxy cell wall. So those basic dye, like a crystal violet, saffronin, methylene blue, or malachite green, they cannot be penetrated. So you need something special. What's a special? You look at the color there, it looks like a little bit pink color. This is called a carbon fusion. So you need to add a carbon fusion, and more important, you need to do a heat steaming. So what is a heat steaming? Heat steaming, there is basically two methods what we can do. One method is you put a glass slides in a, on a water bus. So let's say this is a water bus. And you put a glass slides on the rack. And this is maybe 55 degrees Celsius. So the heat is going to go on. The second thing is you have a glass slides. You put it back and forth on the Bunsen burner. This is... Bouncing burner. You put it back and forth on the bouncing bur on, on the on the bouncing bur bur burner to do the heat fixing. But when you follow the ball by that, you flip it over. You're gonna put a bouncing burner upside down, back and forth to heat it. And we will practice this one in the lab, and half of the lab is do this method. The idea is using five minutes heat steaming to let the dicarbo fusion go inside. And then we follow the by the rings. And after rings, what we do, we're going to have to do a counter stain. Counter staining with methylene blue. That's why you will see those blue color as a background. But the carbon fusion penetrated into the mycobacterial tuberculosis, 
That's exactly what we want. Now, why we have to do the acid faster stain? This reason is that diagnose tuberculosis is a very tedious work. The reason is that the generation time, which means the doubling time for tuberculosis, is much longer than E. coli. So for E. coli, the doubling time is only 20 minutes. What means the doubling time is 1 becomes 2, 2 becomes 4, 4 becomes 8, which is to the power of n. That's only 20 minutes. For mycobacteria tuberculosis, it's neither almost 12 hours to 18 hours. So this is a give you a problem. Okay, I have a patient which is coughing chest pain for about three weeks. So you go to see a doctor. And the doctor did a very easy CPG test on the skin surface. He find there is a swearing, is that right? Usually they do. And do the x-ray find a greenish cloudy area in the lung. So what are we going to do? Can he just get a sputum sample and to the cultivation of the bacteria? Yes, he can do. Because of the doubling time of microbacteria, it took forever. So you need a couple of days to really grow in the bacteria and further identify it. And the patient is there, you cannot wait that long. So what we do, we get a sputum sample, we do the acid faster step. If the acid faster staining, we find that the picture looks like on the slides, we can say this patient is presumptive tuberculosis. And then what we can do, we can give him antibiotics to do the treatment. Let's say penicillin, uh, amoxicillin, tetracycline, all those type of different type of the antibiotics to do the treatment immediately instead of we're waiting for identification of the bacteria. Now certainly we want to identify of the bacteria, that is a later job, and the sputum sample could be packaged in a transport medium and go to the reference lab, they will identify it. But that's gonna take a couple of days. So that's why the acid faster stain is important. And that's why we have to do the acid faster stain. And the acid faster stain, if it's positive, we will say this person most likely is presumptive TB. But the finally, determination of the pathogen, it took a couple of days. Uh, it needs to go to the reference lab. Okay, so that is the acid faster thing. Uh, this is important, so that's one. Definitely you need to know the mycolic acids is make it become a waxy cell wall. That's why we have to use the acid faster thing. Is using, using carbon fusion and with heat steaming. Okay, next one is a cup of staining, endospore capsule and the flagella stain. So we wanna, uh, I wanna keep this one here, so I will using this to introduce to you, one by one. Uh, endospore stain we will do in the lab, but uh, some others we will not be uh, doing. So first of all, is uh, endospore stain. So first of all, you need to know, not all the bacteria has endospore. And we call it an endospore-forming bacteria. So for example, E. coli, they does not have to form an endospore, or very difficult, or cannot do even. Salmonella is not. Pseudomonas is not. Listeria is not. There are two major genomes of bacteria, which is endospore-forming bacteria, is Bacillus and Clostridium. Bacillus, we will be doing the lab work on Thursday. Clostridium, we will talk about detail on the exam too. Clostridium is a big topic. We will talk about Clostridium tetanin, Clostridium difficile, Perfringers and the botulism. And you heard about like infant botulism, woods botulism, food botulism, like canned food, more or less you know some of the knowledge. 
So that's cross chain. So first of all, bacillus and cross chain will form an endospore. And the endospore is also a protection structure. And usually it is in a, a stress environment they will be forming. And we call it a sporation. And when the stress environment is removed, the bacteria could go back to vegetative status, which is normal status. We call it a germination. So that's something we'll talk on Thursday. So in those spore, it is also a rigid system. It is very tough. And the basic dye cannot easy to come in. So in those small stains, very similar to the acid fast stain, we need to use a Bunsen burner to do the heat steaming for five minutes. Now, you need to put something there. You cannot just put heat there to do the steaming. So we need to add a dye. And the dye we have been mentioned, it's a completely very blue color. We have flooding the surface. It is called Mala Chite Green. So we add a Mala Chite Green, flooding on the surface. We do the heat steaming, put a Bunsen burner, on the glass slides back and forth for five minutes. The glass slides will not be dry, though. it's still good. Then you rinse and counter stain with saffron. And finally, what you're going to see, it is very important for the purpose of the endospore stain, is we want to see presence absence of endospore, which means is there endospore. Number two is the location of the endospore. Because the location of the endospore, it is genetic dependent. So what this means, let's say I had an endospore. The endospore, the endospore could be at the center, could be at the terminal, like you go to the airport, could be right in the middle of the center and the terminal, we call it is sub-terminal. So for example, cross trillium, some of them are sub-terminal, bacillus, some of them are terminal. It really depends on the species. So, that's what the endospore for. And you could see the endospore, which is on the picture at the B. Can you see those really very nice green color, like a bubble there? That's the endospore. Why it's green color? Because it's staining with malachite green with heat steaming. And when you see the background, it is pink. That is a counterstain saffron in color. Now, here is something we want to talk about here. We also want to talk about at the lab. We mentioned the gram stain. The principles is based on the cell wall structure. So gram stain, we have to use a very fresh, young culture. But for the endospore staining, we have to use an older culture. Usually a very older culture, more than 72, to even 96 hours. The reason is we want to the bacteria to form in the endospore, and that took time. But luckily, we had a bacteria which is Bacillus cereus, can form in the endospore about 48 hours. That's why we use that in the lab all the time to do the testing of the endospore staining. Okay, so something interesting here. We will mention again on Thursday and practice on the lab. Okay, the next one is the capsule stain. So I'll just move this out and talk about capsule stain. The capsule stain, the picture we're showing is on the above one. So that's for the capsule stain. So 
So first of all, what is a bacterial capsule? Give you a very easy example. You have a diprococcal, streptococcus ammonia. That will cause number one ammonia in the United States. We call it community acquired ammonia. And then they packaged with something. And when you see this heavy packaging, this is polysaccharides, which is uh, sugar, okay? Heavy smear. This is capsule. The capsule is a function we call it a anti phygosome, which means usually the bacteria go into the body, they first of all will meet a macrophage. A macrophage is one component of a white blood cell. They start to kill it. And when the bacteria has a capsule, they could resist it to the attacking of the macrophage. Okay, that's we call the antiphagosome. We'll mention this in the exam four. So how are we gonna do the staining? There are two methods what we could do. Number one, which is on the slides, negative stain. Negative staining, we call the staining capsule. Very good. How we do it? You put one glass like this. You put a bacteria smear there. And then you have another glass right here. And you're going to put a dye. What is a dye? India ink. Nigrosin. Those are we call it an acid dye. So instead of they are staining the specimen, they are staining the background. Okay, so what do you have to do? Is repair this, go this way. So at the end, what it looks like? Looks like a picture like that. The capsule showed up and the background is colored. And you also going to see right here, it's a very good picture, negative staining. That's a streptococcus ammonia, diprococcal. The capsule is obvious, it's a heavy smear, it's a white color, and the background is dark. That is negative stain. That's good to do. Lots of people do that. But we also could do is a directless stain, which is using 5% copper sulfide. And this will be directly staining the polysaccharides. So this is directly staining polysaccharides. So that's a capsule stain. Okay. Phylogenous stain. That's the last one. Okay, we want to talk this one out and we talk about phylogenous stain. Phylogenous stem is in the C picture, looks like beautiful. Uh, we want to talk about that. So first of all, bacteria has a different type of the flagella. What is the flagella we first introduce? Is uh, Antonio Van Le Van Hoek's recording. And I mentioned that's using 200 magnification mechanic microscope. He recorded his own observation of a bacteria. But later on, almost 100 years later, people say that's not a bacteria. That's a bacteria flagella. So it looks like a tail is a flagella. Flagella is composed by flagella, which is a protein. And this is for true movement of a bacteria. Bacteria is not doing the tumbling, not doing those browning movements. It's a true movement. Okay, there is a different structure, like a monotrichos, ampetrichos, lefotrichos. We'll talk about on Thursday. So, let's say bacteria have a phalagen. Now, this is a protein. It's very soft. So, do you think we can do a gram stain? Probably not. Because when we prepare the smear, we do the heat fixing, 
or we even do heat or steaming, what happens? It's going to be melted. So you cannot do it traditionally. So what we do? The same thing we prepare two glass lights. A one glass light is hollow, on, another glass is, is like 60 degrees there. And we let the flagella just do the roaring, a very gentle roaring like this. Let it roll. Okay? When they roll, what are we gonna have to do? We need to add a two basic dye. The two basic dye is tannic acids together with formalin to stick it. And then we need to put some color there. So we have to coat it. Coating with silver nitride. Then it will be showing you the phylogeny. Okay, showing you the phylogeny. That's a phylogeny stone. It looks like that. It's uh, uh, now I believe it's called a, uh, uh, ampertrochus because there's two ends. The phylogeny are two ends of the bacteria. So that's a phylogeny stone. So here you can see a very nice picture which shows you everything. The picture A shows you gram stain, positive or negative. Picture B is acid fast stain, is acid fast or non acid fast. Endospore stain of a bacillus. This is relatively misleading. It should put, um, it should put the relatively, it should put green color there. Okay. Capsule stain, this is basically the negative stain, and the phylogenic stain. This is the bacteria we will be doing in the lab, we will be mentioned is Proteus vulgarius. Lots of the test is positive because Proteus vulgarius has a very strong whole covered flagella. So it's very good moving capability. But the bad thing is on the agar plates, they will not form a colony, it will form a a big smear, we call it a swamp. Okay, so that's a very nice picture. Okay, electron microscope. We're going to introduce you here for the electron microscope. I need something, so I'm going to remove this off. I believe if you already uh, taking the notes, already take a picture, it's up to you for the whole story of the brand's name. So we want to introduce you about the uh, electron microscope. Uh, we won't do this in the lab because uh, the reason is we mentioned about in the uh, WBU the shared facility at uh, the building behind the Evansdale campus library. They have a uh, electron microscope. I have one of the students to look at the stoma of the leafy. Of the leafy greens, we did that a long time ago, but uh, you have to get the training first. So usually the equipment we don't have in our general lab. Okay, we only have light field microscope, but we could introduce something to you. So electron microscope. Electron microscope. Basically has two different types. Number one, we call scanning electron microscope. Scanning electron microscope, the magnification pretty much about 5,000 uh, X. We could see 3D images. And basically, is a scanning machine is on the surface, back and forth. So it looks like that. You could give an overview picture of a fungi, usually it's UK youths, and also could be doing a research for biophile. You could see the 3D images. So that's scanning electron microscope. The second one, we call it a transmission. Electron 
microscope. Transmission electron microscope, the magnification is about 10 to 15,000 X. This is, you could see, the internal structure of certain bacteria or even a fungi. So it gave you very clearly to see the internal structure. Now, what is the difference between electron microscope and a light field microscope? We could draw in you a good comparison figure to talk about that. Okay, let's talk about this. I will put on the top to the bottom. Looks like our microscope is upside down. So let's talk about light field microscope. Okay, and the electron microscope. So what is gonna be the difference? We could do the comparison. Okay, light microscope, the energy resource Obviously, is light. Okay, so I have something right here. It's light. Electron microscope, the energy resource, is electron guns. Something like this. An electron gun. Okay, now what we do? The light is going here, going here, and going here. The so first thing first, you will see, is a condenser. The condenser is glass. Electron microscope, you also will see a condenser. Same thing. But the condenser is magnetic. Okay? And then you have these things going on. Instead of the light going on, what is going on? The electron beams. Okay, what is underneath the condenser? What is the condenser? Let's see for that upside down. Specimen. Okay, now you have a sample. You still have a sample. That's a specimen. That's also a specimen. That's the same. No difference. Okay, so the light is going through here. Going through here. Let's just uh, not talk about the refraction of those things. Okay, now I have another one. What is this? Objective lens. Okay, go to obje objective lens. We have like a 10x, 100x. What are those? It's glass. Okay, now here the beams also goes here. Electron beams goes here, goes here. You also have objective lens. We just don't call it. Because it's, again, by magnetic. Material. Okay, then we go here. Okay, objective lens, you go here. You're gonna have a sample. You're gonna see something. Okay, you go here, you go here, you go here. Then you have what? It's ocular lens. The ocular lens is also glass. And we use our eyes, we could see it. For the electron microscope, you go here, you go here, go here. That's electron beams. And go here is what? Instead of you have an ocular lens to see the eyes, this is a viewing screen. So you have the screens, you see what it looks like. So if you want to talk about that, what's the difference? Energy resource is different. Light view the microscope basically is glass, air, and glass, and this is completely is magnetic. So what we have is resolution power difference. 
and the resolution power, we already talked about this. Light field microscope, 0 0.26 micro, uh, micrometer equals 260 nanometer. How about the electron microscope? Electron microscope's resolution power is pretty much about 0 0.5 nanometer. So you can see, this is basically a 1,000x. How many times about that? About 500. So, something could have reached like this. OK? So somehow. So that's something regarding electron microscope and the light field microscope. Uh, you can see the structure of the uh, transmission, the scanning, what's the difference between that? And uh, this is the one what's using uh, transmission electron microscope to see the inside. So we want to also introduce you a little bit to how we prepare the sample. Okay. Electron microscope is preparing the sample is a little bit different. It's very different or it's not easy to do. So first of all, let's say we have a sample like that. This is not just a heat fixing air dryer. We have to do a quick freezing. And this is usually using liquid nitrogen to do a quick freezing. You know that. Once it's quick freezing, what we do, we have to slice it. So slice into very thin layer. And then once you see the thin layer, you will see something like this happens when you slice it. This is called a <coughs> shadow or shadowing process. Once you have the shadowing process, we need to add something there. So we coated it with heavy metal. The heavy metal most likely we use platinum. The reason is we want to make sure the amount of the electromagnetic there is the same. If you do not coat it with that, it will be changed. Then you use the electron guns, the amount of the electron beams going through will be different. So we have to do that. So these are the procedures we have to, we have to pre pre prepare. And uh, using heavy metal to do the coating, and we could do the observation to see the internal structure. Uh, this is specifically for transmission electron microscope. So here you can see the cell walls, the nuclear gases, and the ribosomes. And this is an example for scanning electron microscope. You could see the surface very clearly. Okay, you could see the surface of 3D images. It's a beautiful 3D images, and you can see very clearly. If especially using like some biofilms, you could see where it grow, what the polysaccharides, the matrix coming. So that's a good, good example. Okay, this is shape and the arrangements. It's very important. And these slides, I hope you. Uh, understand right now because in the exam two we're going to use these as an example to do some of the case studies. So this bacteria shape we have a terminology we call morphology and that is simple we already talked about that it could be coxal It could be lords, or we say bacillus. It could be like this, vibro. But sometimes you need to know. It will be a mixing. It looks like a coxal. It looks like a bacillus. So it also could be cocobacillus. Lots of the pathogen is cocobacillus. Let's say hemophilus influenza, type B hemophilus influenza, cause meningitis. It is a number one childhood disease in the United States. It's a cocobacillus. So it could be the combined of that. 
So that's called the shape and the arrangement. Now, what is arrangement? That means how the bacteria st stack together. Now, the first example we talk about this is the Diprococcyl Diprococcyl is Streptococcus ammonia, is one of that, another one is Neisseria meningitis and Neisseria gonorrhea. It's paired coccyl. Then we also talk about it could be chain like that. Streptococcus. And then it could be grape shape. Like you buy a bunch of grape go in at a Kruger. So that's grape shape. Now, which bacteria is a chain shape? Streptococcus. Look at the top, Streptococcus agalactia. This is what we call it's a group B Streptococcus. And the pregnant, pregnant woman at 35 years or weeks have to do a screening test. Because otherwise, if it's positive, the newborn will have meningitis or ammonia. On the top, that's Streptococcus agalactia, group B Streptococcus. We'll talk about that. There's some like a cluster, like a grape, is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, we will mention a lot later. Then, sometimes, you will see some of the bacteria looks like this. It's called tetrad. Micrococcus labius. It's tetrad. Four of them stack together. And could be eight of them stacked together, we call it a sassini. But we don't talk about that. I never see anything in the lab. More. Okay, lots, we also call it a bacillus. We already mentioned the cocoa bacillus. Very short lots. Vibro, comma shaped. Spiral, spiral sheets. It's flexible helix. So we gave you some of the example. This is a bacillus. The difference between bacillus and the E. coli, E. coli is short lots, and bacillus is large lots. This is a vibrochorio. It's a comma shaped vibro. This is basically is a passenger for the fish and the seafoods. It will cause a crutination of the blood cell if you get contaminated and caused by severe diarrhea. And the water diarrhea, you're going to lose 10 pounds of the water, 10 liters of water in like, one, in, in like uh, five minutes. So the patient, when they contaminated with vibrochorial, as shown in the figure A, the first thing what they have to do is rehydration, put the water back, plus using <laughs> antibiotics. This is a picture B, corner of capillary back to jejuna. Capular bacteria is spiral shaped sparium. This is a number two pathogen in the poultry meat. It's a microallophilic bacteria. It's very difficult to grow in the lab. Very ironically, can grow very well on the poultry skin surfaces. And we did a bunch of work for capular bacteria, but it's difficult to do. This is what I mentioned. What is the staining technology for this? What is the microscope used for this? It's dark field microscope. And this pathogen is leptospiral interrogans. It's a spiral sheet. One of the other two spiral sheets is syphilis, trypanema platyan, and uh, Lyme disease, Borella bugdorferro. So that's one of them, leptospiral interrogans. It's a hook shape. It's a spiral sheet. So that's very interesting. When you are using Gram stain technology, we could see the gram results, positive or negative. It's already differentiated bacteria into a gram positive or gram negative. Then we recalling their shape. We recalling the arrangements. If it's a coupled with symptoms, we could do a presumptive determination what type of the pathogen it is. It is a faster way to do the treatment. Okay? So that's what we have for our uh, lecture two. So that's what we have today, and then we're going to talk more on Thursday.